So I got to be honest, about 8 o'clock this morning when I showed up and it was pouring and our parking lot was worse than it is right now, Brad and I kind of did this over and under how many people were going to be here today. And um, I guessed 150 and he guessed 250. So uh, I think Brad is actually closer and so I probably owe him lunch or something like that. Um, let me, let me commend you for being here. I had, uh, I had, I don't know how many people call and text and say, man, Pastor Brian, we can't get out of our house today. We're flooded in. And we draw, I drove through the neighborhoods here in Hollywood, and there was literally standing water everywhere. So whether you drove to church, rode a boat to church, paddled to church, or swam to church, I am so glad that you are here this morning. You made my day, and I'm glad you're here. I am so glad to see Surgeon Vernita Marshall with us today. Vernita led our worship for a long time, and uh, then this handsome guy, Serge, came and married her and swept her off her feet, and they moved up north just a little bit. But uh, anyways, I'm glad that they are here today. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday. Today is the day that we celebrate the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. The fact that each and every one of us who have trusted Christ as our personal Savior have the Holy Spirit within us and he's gifted us and he empowers us to live the life that he's called us to live. We celebrate that today on this Pentecost Sunday. Some say that Pentecost Sunday was the day that the church was actually formed too. So this is, a, uh, this is an important day for us. Genesis chapter 3, that was Eric Howard, one of our elders who just came and read that, that long passage for us. So let me begin with a question today. Did you ever see what's happening in the world around us and think, what in the world is going on? Did you ever do that? I mean, we see mass shootings, another one in Texas this week. We see record drug addiction in our country. We see inner city violence in many of the inner cities. We see political division in our country, maybe like we've never experienced before. And we're experiencing more broken families than maybe we've ever experienced. And that's just in our country. That's just in the United States. If you travel outside of the United States, you see poverty and hunger and corruption and genocide. We see everything that's going on and we ask ourselves the question, how, how did the world become such an evil place? How is it that this creation that God created in perfection has gradually deteriorated and got worse and worse and worse until we experience many of the things that we are experiencing today. I mean, we look at the text that we read last week in Genesis chapter 1, and we saw that God saw his creation. He saw that it was good. What happened to the paradise of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2? I'd remind you, we ended last week in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, where, where after God had created everything, he made this declaration in Genesis 1, 31. He says, and God saw everything that, it, that he had made, and behold, it was very good. He doesn't just say that it was good. God looks at his creation, and God says, man, this is very good. As I read that and I watch the news this week, as you watch the news this week, I sit back and think, man, what happened to the beauty, that, that goodness, that perfection of God's creation? I wrote in your outline that the beauty and the goodness of the creation seen in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 are soon lost. Beginning as early as Genesis chapter 4, we see a world that is transformed from a place of perfection, peace, and harmony to a world of sin, violence, destruction, and death. We get to Genesis chapter 4 and we see that Cain murders his brother Abel. 
We get to Genesis chapter 6, just a few chapters removed from, from, from paradise, from the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, And the Lord saw the wickedness of man, or that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the very next verse, it says this, And the Lord regretted, the Lord regretted, that he had made man. And quite frankly, as we walk through the Bible, the situation doesn't get any better. Throughout Scripture, we see example after example of family conflicts, incestuous relationships, wartime atrocities, and sinful struggles. We ask ourselves this question, what happened to God's perfect creation? The answer to that question, and so many more, is found in the passage of Scripture that Eric read for us just a few moments ago. It's found in Genesis chapter 3. And we see the beauty of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. We see the evil and wickedness of Genesis chapter 4 and beyond. And we realize that something cataclysmic, something catastrophic happened in Genesis chapter 3 that forever changed the course of human history. Genesis chapter 3. Last week we started a series that we're simply titling The Story of God. And we're taking a four-part series, and instead of looking at the Bible as 66 different stories or or a volume or encyclopedia of all kinds of different stories, we're seeing that the Bible contains one narrative. The Bible contains one story from beginning to end, from creation to glory. We see one story. It is the story of God. And we're walking through the next four weeks. We're seeing four things. We saw creation last week. Today, we're going to see out of Genesis chapter 3, the fall. Next week, and when I say fall, we're not talking about September, October, and November. All right? We're talking about the fall of man, the fall of Adam and Eve. Next week, Brad's going to be looking at my favorite message in the series, Redemption. Here comes Jesus to the rescue. That was all a part of God's plan. And then we'll end our series looking at consummation or glory. We'll see God bringing everything to an end and him being honored and glorified just as he planned from the very beginning. So today we kind of want to answer the question, what happened? Why is there so much evil in the world? Why why am, am I tempted and continue to struggle with sin? Why do we see all of the atrocities that are taking place? Once again, dive with me into Genesis chapter 3, and we want to see a couple of truths that, that, that not only condemn Adam and Eve today, but quite frankly, they shed light on why Brian struggles and why you struggle and why we desperately need a Savior. So if you have your outline, the very first thing that I wrote in my outline was this, Adam and Eve succumbed, they gave in, they surrendered to the temptation to want to be like God. So Eric already read the passage. I'm not going to take the time and read through the passage once again, but Genesis chapter 3 begins with Adam and Eve enjoying the beauty and the benefits of God's good creation. All went well, and we really don't know how how long of a time lapsed between Genesis chapter 2 and what's taking place in Genesis chapter 3. Could have been a longer period of time, could have been a shorter period of time. The Bible really doesn't tell us, but all is seemingly fine until Eve has a conversation with a sneaky serpent. Now, if you're sitting back wondering, and the question floats to the top, and I, I get it, how a serpent could talk back to Eve. I mean, what was going on there? Is this a fictional story? Is this a real story? We'll get to that in just a moment. But for now, I just want us to look at the serpent's accusation. So here's Eve enjoying the beauty of the Garden of Eden when all of a sudden she is approached by a serpent, and the serpent says in verse 1, did God really say? 
And so we see there in the Garden of Eden, the serpent, a.k.a. Satan, Lucifer, doubts the veracity, the truthfulness, the authenticity of what God had told the very first couple. As, as Eve hears the serpent Satan's question, from the beginning, she's right on point. At least, at least initially, she is right on point. She was well aware of God's prohibition and the consequences of disobeying it. So as the serpent comes, as Satan comes and, and doubts God's word, Eve, tell me, did God really say that? Notice her response in verse 3. She says, yes, he did. We, we cannot eat of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, nor can we touch it, because if we do, we will die. I would sit back and remind you that at this point, Obviously, the Bible wasn't written. <laughs> the law hadn't been written. There wasn't a series of prohibitions that they were given. God didn't give them a list of commands saying, do these things and don't do these things. There was only one prohibition. There was only one command that God had given them. He said, basically, see that tree in the midst of the garden? Don't eat the fruit of it. Because if you eat the fruit of it, you will die. Adam and Eve got that, and so when the serpent came and tempted them to eat the fruit and doubted what God said, Eve knew the response. No doubt she had talked about it with Adam. No doubt God had reiterated it to them. But the serpent was cunning. As the text says, the serpent was crafty. In verse 4, he responds, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and notice what he says. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Follow me today. That declaration might sound familiar, at least to those of us who uh, are familiar with the Old Testament. That desire to be like God what, was what got Satan kicked out of heaven in the first place. Do you remember Isaiah chapter 14 relates that to us. In Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, Satan was Lucifer. He was the anointed cherub. God had created him. He was in, he was in heaven. He was one of the anointed cherubim. And Isaiah kind of gives us insight, pulls back the curtain for us, and allows us to see what had taken place because uh, it tells us, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heaven. I will ascend above the stars. I will set my throne on high, I will make myself like the most high. So here's Satan in heaven before this ever took place, desiring to be what? Desiring to be just like God. So here in the Garden of Eden, Satan the, uh, Satan the sinner now becomes Satan the seducer. And he tempts Eve, he tempts Adam and Eve to commit the same act of rebellion that he had committed. How would Eve respond? Obviously, she, she knew the prohibition that God had given. How would Eve respond? Well, we know the rest of the story. Eric just read it, and we're familiar with it. Eve gave in to the temptation, took of the fruit, and then passed the fruit on to Adam, and he ate as well. By the way, on Wednesday night, one of the things we're going to be dealing with was is this question was the sin of Adam the same as the sin of Eve? And we're, we're going to dive into that on Wednesday night. It's a really interesting and profound study. But if you're following along in your notes, here's what I say, and this is where it begins to apply to us. You see, as in Eve's case and as in our case often, temptation causes us to question and disagree with what God says. The serpent had placed that doubt in Eve's mind, had placed that doubt in Eve's heart. Did God really say that? And for Eve to partake of that forbidden fruit, she had in her mind to come to a place in which she not only doubted whether God really said it, but she had to disagree with what God had said. You know the story. Eve believed his lie. She took the forbidden fruit she believed the serpent instead of believing what God had said. Let me pause there for a second because all of us at some time, at some point, no doubt have read that story and we sit back and think, oh my word, if it wasn't for Eve. 
If it wasn't for Adam and Eve, we wouldn't find ourselves in the position that we're in. How could she not have believed God? How could she have disagreed with God? What God had told her personally. Who would disagree with the words of God? Let me pause for a second and say this. You and I, on a regular basis, commit the exact same sin that Adam and Eve committed. You might sit back and say, Brian, I haven't touched a forbidden fruit in a long time, huh? (laughs) That's not what I'm talking about. You and I hear what God says in his word, and we rationalize what God says, and we make a decision in our mind and in our heart whether we agree with it and whether we are going to obey it or not. That's exactly what was taking place in the Garden of Eden. They were faced with this decision. God said this, am I going to believe it? Am I going to obey it? Or am I going to disagree with it? And at that moment, they chose to disagree with what God had said. We do the same thing. You do the same thing. I do the same thing. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Well, God says very clearly in his word, don't lie. Tell the truth. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. But we think, man, in certain situations, we got to tell an untruth, right? There's just certain situations that necessitate us telling a white lie. And so what we do, we know what God says in his word. We rationalize it in our minds, and we come to our own decision, and we disagree with what God said in his word. We know that God says that sexual relations outside of marriage are wrong. Man, we disagree with that. We think, man, that is such an Old Testament prohibition. Who would abide by that in this day and age? We take what God says, we rationalize it, we disagree with it, and we do what we want to do. God says in his word, honor me with your first fruits. And we sit back and for some reason we don't include generosity in our budget. And we just don't do that. God says, love your neighbor. And man, quite frankly, we have a hard time getting along with that person who lives next door to us. We know what God says. We know what the command is. But it doesn't make any sense to us. And somehow in our mind, just like Adam and Eve, we take what God said, we take the command, the prohibition, we rationalize it, and at the end, we do what we want to do. God says, man, don't don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And we sit back and allow life to dictate whether we meet together with God's people or not. You you see, church, here's, here's what I'm saying. Like Adam and Eve, we often question and disagree with what God says. It's easy for us to criticize and and condemn Adam and Eve for what they did, but quite frankly, we are guilty of the exact same things. And when we do that, by the way, we elevate ourselves to a place of deity, at least in our own minds, overturning what God says in his word. Here's what happened. Temptation causes us, we're faced with something that causes us to question and disagree with what God says. There's a second thing that's happening here, and it's, it's a little bit deeper, maybe a little bit more profound, but temptation causes us to see sin as more desirable than what God says. I want you to notice, if you have your Bible, your iPad, your phone right in front of you, we might put it up on the screen, I'm not sure, but in verse 6, it says this, so Eve was, Eve was presented with this temptation, whatever this forbidden fruit was, she was presented with it, and it says this in verse 6, once again, remember, she knew what the command was, she knew what the prohibition was, but verse 6 says this, when Eve saw, when, when she became aware that the tree was good for food, notice this phrase, and that it was a delight to the eyes, that, hey, this wasn't going to be a negative experience. This is going to be a pleasurable experience. This isn't something that you're not going to enjoy. This is something that you're really going to enjoy. When she saw that what God had had prohibited was, to the contrary, according to the serpent, a delight to her eyes, 
and that the tree was desired to make one wise. When all of a sudden the way that she viewed this sin changed, what happened? All of a sudden she reevaluated her position. The temptation at that moment became more desirable than what God had said. The temptation became more desirable, I would submit, than even God himself at that moment. To Eve, the most important thing at that moment was giving in to the pleasure of that temptation. And at that moment, she forgot about God, she forgot about God's prohibition, and the only thing that mattered to her was gratifying that desire that she had. And as a result, she took of that which had been prohibited. I spent a lot of time thinking and praying about this passage this week. We've spent a lot of time as a staff talking and praying about this passage this week. And I've sat back and thought, what was it that was so desirable to Eve? And as you Google this, you know, put, put Google images, you know, or in Google images, Google forbidden fruit and see what comes up. You know, you see this bright, shiny, beautiful apple, you know. I like apples, but I'm not going to need an apple to, you know, it's not like God or an apple. What am I going to give in to? Or, you know, some people have said that it had to be grapes because grapes are what produce wine, and we know how bad wine is, so it had to be grapes. And so, by the way, we don't have any idea what the forbidden fruit was. Probably a fruit that we don't even know today. I asked myself, what was so desirable to Eve? As we met with a group of pastors, some said, well, it it was what the serpent said in verse 4, where he said, man, you will not die. And so that temptation to live forever was what provoked Eve to take of the forbidden fruit. But think with me, they already had immortality, If the serpent was offering her, listen, you're never going to die, she could have looked at him and said, I want you to know that's where I am right now. I'm never going to die. It, It wasn't immortality that the serpent offered to her. She, excuse me, she already had that, had that. There had to be something different that she saw, something so transformational that caused her to believe what the serpent was telling her. What did she see? The text doesn't tell us exactly. Here's what I believe. This is what Brian believes, all right? And, and, and whether you agree or disagree, that's cool. It's not, it's not a matter of major doctrine. But I believe she saw a transformed serpent there. She saw a serpent who was able to think. She saw a serpent who was able to rationalize she saw a serpent that was, that was able to converse, a serpent that was able to convince. It's quite possible, the text doesn't tell us, but it's quite possible that the serpent looked at that Eve and said, listen, I've eaten of the forbidden fruit. Look, look at the results of what has taken place. Listen, you can be like me or maybe even you can be better than me. I ate the fruit, and look what it has done for me. Listen, we don't know for sure that that's what had taken place, but the serpent offered her something at that moment that was more attractive than God. He offered her something that at that moment caused her to swing from one side to the other, that caused her to move from God's side to the serpent's side that caused her to desire to what? To be like God. And all of a sudden in Eve's mind, that which was an abomination now became attractive to her. She's sitting back taking, okay, man, this is what the serpent's offering me and this is what God has for me. And she, here she is weighing both of those options, that which was abominable to God and that which was attractive to God, that which was attractive to the serpent and that which was abominable to the serpent. And at that moment, here's what she did. She made the wrong choice. Sin 
was pleasurable to her, her at that moment. She saw that it was a delight, and she succumbed. She gave in to that which she knew displeased God. Man, church, think with me. We often do the exact same thing. Maybe we don't sit back in our minds, say, you know, say, okay, here's what God says. Here's what the world is offering me. Which one is better? We don't, maybe we don't take the time to rationalize that, but I assure you today that whenever you are confronted with temptation, that is what is taking place in your life. What the world is offering you now is going against directly what God has told you and me. And at that moment, here's what we do. We weigh those two options And sadly, like Eve, we often choose the wrong thing. Don't get me wrong. Sin often looks better, does it not? The enemy has a way of of taking that which can destroy your life and packaging it in a way that it looks incredibly pleasant. It looks incredibly delightful. It is enticing. It is seducing. And it seduces you. Let's be honest today. Nobody ever said that sin is not fun. Nobody ever said that sin is not pleasurable. But but catch me, sin has an expiration date. It does. There is an expiration date to sin. In Hebrews chapter 11, when the writer of Hebrews is talking about the faith of Moses, it says, he chose the riches of God rather than choosing, here's the phrase that he describes, the fleeting pleasures of sin, sin that can be enjoyed just for a moment. I would say this, church, sin may look delicious, but there is always a hook. There is always a catch. The consequences of sin are far worse than any pleasure that you and I could ever experience. And Adam and Eve experience it here in the passage. And so the first thing we see is that Adam and Eve succumb to the temptation to want to be just like God. Notice the second thing. Let me go quickly. The second thing is this. As a result of their sin, Adam and Eve lost everything. You know the story. I don't have to repeat the entire story. I mentioned three things that Adam and Eve lost. And then I want to get personal with us today. The first thing is this. They lost their immortality. They lost their immortality. They had been created with the ability to live forever, and they lost their immortality. As a result of their sin, they became mortal. They would not live forever. Their life now had an end date, just like your life and my life has an end date. In Genesis chapter 3, Eric read this just a few moments ago in verse 19. As God gives the punishment towards Adam for his sin, God says this, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Adam and Eve lost their immortality. Genesis chapter 5 verse 5 tells us of Adam's physical demise. Adam lived a long time, 930 years, but it says this, and he died. Adam, who was created to live forever because of his sin, lost his immortality and died. I love the, I love the quote. I, I quote it often at funerals, the quote by George Bernard Shaw when he made the statement, the statistics of death are quite impressive. One out of every one person dies. Adam and Eve and you and I, we have lost our immortality. We see that in the passage. The second thing that I think is even more grave is they lost their intimacy with God. They lost their intimacy with God. Verse 8 says something that when you think about it, sometimes we read through scripture and don't think about it, but verse 8 says that after Adam and Eve sinned, God came down as was his custom to do, and he was walking through the garden. And I'm sure as he had done scores of times, if not hundreds of times before, God crying out, hey Adam, where are you? Not that God didn't know, but hey Adam, where are you? But this occasion was different. Adam didn't run out to have a conversation with God. He didn't look forward to that intimate moment that he would spend with his creator as he had done so many times before. 
Verse 8 tells us this. Adam and Eve hid themselves from God. Verse 9, again, God says, Adam, where are you? Church, see this. For the first time in their young lives, Adam and Eve felt guilt. The text tells us that they, they realized that they were naked. And as a result of that, they were ashamed. God actually looks at him, and God knew the answer, but God looked at him and, and basically said, man, what's the deal here, Adam? You've changed. <laughs> Who told you you were naked? Why, why are you ashamed? Something has changed in our relationship. Well, quite frankly, what had changed was that their relationship had changed. That, that one sin that Adam and Eve had committed affected the intimacy that they had with God. And quite frankly, you and I still struggle with that on a regular basis, do we not? That, that, that intimacy, that close relationship with the Lord. Let me mention a third thing. The third thing is this. They lost their access to paradise. They lost their access to paradise. Verse 23 says, therefore the Lord sent him out from the garden. The garden that I believe was, was created just for them. A garden that God had created for the purpose of placing man there so that man could enjoy the beauty and the perfection of God's created paradise, utopia, whatever you want to call it, Eden. God had created it for the purpose of putting Adam and Eve there. And now because of their sin, they were cast out from the garden. They were evicted, as it were paradise that had been created for them was now off limits. You read Genesis chapter 3, from this moment forward, life would be different for Adam and Eve. Life would now be filled with thorns and thistles, pain and death. John Milton said it right, paradise was truly lost. The paradise that God had given them, the paradise that God had prepared for them, the paradise gained, as it were, now became paradise lost. Man, we read that, and, 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 and there's so many questions that flood our minds. How could they? What would have happened if? You know, what if Eve would have sinned, but Adam wouldn't? Have? There's so many questions that come to our mind. Many of them are condemnatory towards Adam and Eve. But here's what I want you to see today, because today we're looking at the entire story. We're looking at the big picture. And so how does Genesis 3 apply to you and me? How does it apply to Brian in 2018 and you in 2018? Here's what I want you to catch, and I said it in the most simple way that we possibly can so that you and I catch it. Here's the truth. You are just like Adam. <laughs> and you are just like Eve. Adam and Eve's sin does not just affect, affect them. Their sin had a devastating effect on the whole human race. Let me say that again. Their sin did not just affect them. Their sin had a devastating effect on the whole human race race. I want to pause here for a second. I wasn't planning on saying this, but this is so very important because I don't know how many times I hear people tell me as I talk to them about their sin, they look at me and say, well, Brian, you don't get it. What I'm doing, no big deal. It doesn't affect anybody else. It only affects me. Look at me. Your sin affects other people. Your sin affects your family. Your sin affects those who are following in your footsteps. No man is an island. No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. Just as the sin of Adam and Eve has affected us, man, church, I'd submit to you that your sin affects those around you. Their sin had a devastating effect on the whole human race. You say, Brian, what does that mean? Let's talk theology for just a second, okay? Adam's sinful nature was passed on to every one of his descendants. Write that down. Think about that for just a second. Adam's sinful nature was passed on to every one of his 
descendants. I want to read, grab your Bibles. I want you to see this. If you can see it, and we'll put it up on the screen, but I really want you to see it in your Bible if you can. Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul talks about this, and the Apostle Paul does a comparison, as it were, between us and Adam and between Jesus and Adam. Romans chapter 5, I want to read three verses, then we'll chat about it and read three verses. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, notice what Paul says. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man. Now, I mean, obviously we're talking about Adam and Eve. So sin came into the world through one couple and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all have sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin was not counted where there was no law. In other words, then the law was not given for hundreds of years until Moses gave the law. And so the Israelites not, might, might not have understood, you know, all the sins that they were racking up. But they were still guilty of it because they still died. They died even before the law was ever given. Verse 14, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. You sit back and say, Brian, what are you talking about? Well, from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, there was still only one prohibition. The only prohibition prohibition was this, you cannot take of the fruit of the garden. And from Adam to Moses, there was no other command that was given, but people kept on dying. Even though the command, the law, had not been uh, completely given. And so even though they didn't understand all the ramifications of what they were doing, there was still a consequence for their sin. Like the transgression of Adam, who was the type of the one to come. Here's what Paul is saying. I've already given it to you today. Paul is saying, Paul is saying this, Adam's sinful nature was passed on to every one of his descendants. All right, put in your thinking caps for just a second. Paul teaches us here in Romans chapter 5 that our federal head, um, that, that as our federal head, Adam's transgression and his condemnation was imputed are passed on to every one of us. Now, you might read that as I have a conversation with people on a regular basis, and we talked about this today. You might read that and think, man, that's not fair. So are you telling me today that I have to die because of Adam's sin? Are you telling me today that that I have to bear the consequences of the fact that Adam and Eve sin? I mean, and now I'm a sinner, not because of my own sin. I'm a sinner because of Adam's sin. Let me give you a couple of thoughts. I didn't put these up on the screen. Let me give you a couple of thoughts. Stay with me for just a second, okay? The first is this. The first is this. You are not free from sin. You and I are guilty ourselves. Can I get an amen? (laughs) <laughs> Nobody wants to amen that. I don't either, all right? You and I are not, it's not guilt-free. We're not guilt-free. We're sinners. I mean, it would be one thing if you and I lived a perfect life, and we looked back at Adam and said, that sorry, no good rascal, I've lived a perfect life, I've never sinned, but I'm dying because of him. I would get it if that's the case, but that simply is not the case. If you and I were put in the exact situation, I'm convinced that you and I would sin like Adam and Eve. You say, Brian, why is that? Because we've done worse. We've done worse. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Listen, what they did was partake of a forbidden fruit. What have we done? We've gossiped. We've lied. We've cheated. We've backstabbed on others. We've been dishonest. We've demonstrated a lack of integrity. We've lost our tempers. We've destroyed our relationships. We've ignored God. We've done our own thing. It's easy for us to look back and condemn them and say, man, they took of that forbidden fruit. But listen, I want you to catch this. You and I are just as guilty before God as Adam and Eve. That's why Paul says in Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, no, not one. And verse 23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The second thing that I would add is this, and we'll move on. To reject Adam's headship is to reject Jesus' headship. 
Because that's what Paul is really talking about in the passage. If you go back to Romans chapter 5 and verse 15, he says this, but the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin, for the judgment followed one man's trespass, brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Wow, that's a mouthful. All right, here's what what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, okay, I get it. We're all guilty because of Adam. We recognize Adam as our federal head. He sinned, and as a result of that, we sin. We have a sinful nature that is given to us by him. But Jesus came to become our spiritual head. And just as Adam represents us in sin and Adam represents us in death, so Jesus represents us in life. Jesus represents us in forgiveness. Jesus represents us in justification. Jesus represents us in sanctification. I find it so awesome and so funny at times that we want to reject the headship of Adam saying it's not fair that one man sinned and we're all guilty, but we gladly want to accept the headship of Jesus Christ saying one man died for all. I get that. That one doesn't make any sense to me. And here's what Paul is saying. If one man's sin plunged all of us into condemnation. It is one man's perfect life and death that lifts us from that condemnation and places us on solid ground and allows us to be justified and sanctified and perfect with God. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Paul goes further and states that just as Adam is our representative who led us into sin, so Jesus is our head who rescues us and leads us to righteousness. Here's the next point that I want you to see. Like Adam and Eve, you and I desperately need to be rescued and brought back to intimacy with God. Listen, this is the story. This is the story of God, that God created a world that was perfect, and and man blew it. Man blew it, and because of that, man lost everything that he had gained. But God, in his infinite, merciful, compassionate love, sends Jesus to the rescue. And, And here's the difference. You heard me say last week that you're not the hero of the story, nor am I the hero of the story. Jesus is the hero of the story. And Jesus has been given us for the purpose of rescuing us from our sinful condition. Let me see you one, let me say one last thing. And this is the deep uh, digging work. We're just basically laying the groundwork for the message that Brad is going to preach next week. Because you can't, you can't see the need of a redeemer if you don't realize how lost you are. If you don't see your sinful condition, you sit back and say, well, that story of redemption is not necessary for me. It's absolutely necessary because we're all sinners. But here's the fourth question, and it's the question that I'm going to lay out today and we're going to answer next week. The fourth question is this, how will God bring us back to the garden? Notice verse 24, if you have that, the last verse, so Adam and Eve sinned. They're evicted from the Garden of Eden. And verse, verse, is it verse 24, is it verse, um, where am I? Well, if I'm in Romans, that'd be in Genesis. That'd be really good here. Genesis 3, 24, it says this. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. You see, the question is this, how do fallen sinners recapture the tree of life? It's interesting, the tree of life is mentioned one other time. If you you can go all the way to the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, the, the letters that are given to the churches, the letter to the church of Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7 says this, he who has an ear Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the one who conquers, I will grant what? To eat of what? The tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. 
So from Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, when Adam and Eve were evicted from the garden, the cherubim is placed there with a flaming sword saying, nobody is going to get back to the tree of life. To Genesis, when God says, here's what I want. I want to grant to everyone who believes access to the tree, access to the Garden of Eden. I want to give them life. How does that happen? Basically, from Genesis chapter 4 through the rest, it's the story, not, not directly, but it's the story of man trying to figure out how do we get back to the garden? How do we make it back to that utopia, that paradise that God created for us, where God wanted us to be? And man has tried all types of things, why, why science is going to get us there, and we're going to advance and advance, and, and that's going to get us there. And it hasn't gotten us there, even though we thank the Lord for science. We sit back in all of the things that, that we have attempted as human beings, why religion is going to get us there. Why do you think we have hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of denominations? Everybody is what? Trying to recapture that which God originally gave to us to get back to the Garden of Eden, to have once again what God created for us and what God created us to be. How do we get back? It's interesting, in Genesis chapter 3, God gives us a glimpse, just a little glimpse of what he is about to do. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Can we put that up on the screen? Do we got it? God, in his condemnation of the serpent, says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He tells the serpent, he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You say, Brian, what in the world does that mean? Is that cryptic or what? What in the world is that taking place? That's the first mention of the gospel in Scripture. We actually call that the proto-evangelium, the first mention of the gospel. You say, Brian, what does that mean? You got to come back next week to hear what it means. You've got to come back next week. Brad's, Brad's going to talk about it next week, probably more eloquent than I could. Listen, here's what I wanted to say, and I'm done. We're all guilty. The best of us, the very best of us are sinners, and we desperately need a Savior. You might have watched, I didn't, I was traveling. You might have watched the royal wedding yesterday. I'm not sure whether, if you got up at 5 o'clock to watch the royal wedding, God bless you. Um, I didn't watch it, but I have heard over and over again about the sermon that Michael Curry preached in the wedding. Michael Curry is the bishop of the Anglican Church in the United States, and I won't do everything. I want to show you this phrase that Michael said. By the way, he preached the gospel in the message. And he said this, speaking of Jesus, he died to save us all. He didn't die for anything he could get out of it. Oh, shoot. (laughs) Do we have it? That must have been so powerful. There we go. He didn't die for anything he could get out of it. Jesus did not get an honorary doctorate for dying. He wasn't getting anything out of it. He gave up his life. He sacrificed his life for the good of others, for the well-being of the world. Why? For us, Michael Curry said. He went on and said, that's what love is. Love is not selfish or self-centered. Love can be sacrificial and in so doing, it becomes redemptive. That way of unselfish, sacrificial, redemptive love changes lives. And it can change the world. And if you agree with me, walk right in front of me with a red umbrella. Uh, The fall. God created a perfect world. And we could say today that Adam and Eve blew it. But the simple truth is that you and I blew it. You and I blow it. We desperately need a hero. 
We desperately need a Savior. We desperately need Jesus, who has come for the purpose of giving his life as a ransom for us. So if you're here today and you have this high opinion of yourself, and you sit back and say, man, other people are sinners, but I'm not, I want you to see yourself as God sees you today. You might be better than anybody else in your family. You might be better than anybody else in this room. You might be better than anybody else in South Florida. I have no idea, but when you compare yourself not to us, when you compare yourself to a holy, righteous, perfect God, we are all condemned, and we all desperately need Jesus. Have you reached out to Jesus? Jesus and Jesus alone is the answer for the ills of our world. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Help us to see the big story of the Bible. Lord, help us to realize how desperately we need you. We can't make it on our own. We can try, but, but we just have this, this innate tendency to blow it on a regular basis. We need redeemed. We need justified. We need to be sanctified. We need the indwelling Holy Spirit of God who was given to us so that we can be who you've always intended for us to be. Oh God, help us to realize that your story is not complete yet, but you're working in our lives. He who began a good work in us will perform it, will complete it, until the consummation, until the glory, until the day of Jesus Christ. Help us to reach out to Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.